Well, I want to take one more quick diversion, this time to ask some fan questions from my followers. So this first one is from at Apex Dream Cars, and he's asking, can you tell us the story about getting Martin Brundle's first class airline seat? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's very simple. If you look at Martin Brundle and Mark Blundell in Japanese, and you take the first letter M and in our surnames, they are spelt the same in Japanese characters. <laughs> uh, so basically I arrived at the airport Bearing in mind that I was the new boy on the block at Brabham when I was teammates with Martin, and Martin was the superstar. So he went everywhere first-class travel, and I went everywhere in the back of the plane because, you know, I was the, the apprentice. So <clears throat> I arrived at the airport in, uh, in Tokyo, and we were going on to Australia for the, the last Grand Prix. And because I was in the back of the plane, I was there early to check in, as you need to be, and uh, got presented with this first class seat um, and I thought oh you know they, they've recognized me I'm a Formula One driver so they must have upgraded me you know how, how lovely so I got on the plane and was very happy with myself that I was sitting in like number 2A or something uh, and much to my uh, sort of um, surprise I saw a red faced Martin Brundle you know who was my teammate at the time so I know him very well in the doorway of the plane you know looking at me daggers and sort of acknowledging like you need to move you know like like this with his head like anyway the japanese stewardess came and asked me if she could see my boarding pass of which i showed her and she compared it to the one that martin had and also i was being a little bit sort of uh arrogant at the time and saying you know i'm not moving this is my seat i'm staying here because by this time everybody in first class was all f1 people and they kind of cottoned on and realized what had happened so I had to go along with it. And I did nine hours in 2B, and I think Martin did nine hours in 65F. So um, I won the day. He's never forgiven me for that either. And, uh, and to be honest, I've never paid him for the difference in airfare. So there you go. Oh, so even as F1 drivers, you guys still had to pay for your own plane tickets? Yes, and, uh, and as F1 drivers, we were highly competitive. So, you know, if I got the upper hand of him to sit in his first-class seat, I was going to take it. That was a psychological barrier done. Yeah, make sure that you get you get the better rest on the nine hours, right? And be ready for Australia. There you go. Yeah. All right. So, well, the second question is from Mouse Media and saying, between an, Indy, between an Indy car and an F1 car, which one is more difficult to drive? Uh, well, if you said an Indy car on an oval then I would pretty much put uh, an Indy car on an oval as uh, being extremely difficult to drive because, you know, the nuances and the margins and tolerances are so small to get the car handling to your liking and to handle in the, uh, in the environment of all those other cars around you. I'd say that's probably as tough as it comes in driving a race car at, uh, at the finite edge. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the purest element and the performance edge, F1 car would be, you know, the ultimate in terms of its pure input and outputs. So, you know, in, in some ways they look similar and they do the same job in many ways, but the differences are quite noticeable. But, you know, I've, I've never been as quick as anything other than an Indy car, you know, 253 miles an hour uh, in a straight line on Fontana and 227 in a corner. And I think we did two miles in 29.9 seconds or something. So crazy speeds. But again, doing 220 odd or 226 miles an hour in a Formula One car at uh, Hockenheim or Monza was also a crazy experience as well. So um, horses for courses. Yeah, and well, you, you would know something about ovals, right? Because I, if I believe, remembering correctly, it was Rio, right? In 1996 or something like that? You had a really big crash there, right? On a tri-oval, I had brake failure, yeah, at 200 miles an hour. So I had 198 miles an hour impact into a concrete wall with no brakes. I, uh, I think the, the thing I remember like really well is you're saying that you know after you realized that your brakes have failed, you tried to aim for the back of the car in front of you, which happened to be your teammate. <laughs> uh, yeah, I actually aimed uh, down on the apron and went across the grass to try and hit him. So uh, that was done on purpose because I, I felt that if I was going to hit the concrete wall at that speed, the chances of me surviving and living were slim. 
So I thought if I could hit him at least and take some of the energy out, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any regard for my teammate, but uh, at that point, self-preservation kicked in. So that was the, the aim and the target at that point. Lucky for Maurizio, my teammate, I missed him, uh, you know, probably by about an inch, but yeah. Uh, yeah, lucky for him, I missed him. But, you know, we're still here to talk about it. So that's, that's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just thought it was funny because, you know, obviously that, that makes sense that, you know, survival instinct kicks in, right? But um, I think whatever YouTube video had happened to watch you saying that people immediately in the comment section were like, did he really say that he was aiming for the back of his teammate? And they, they found that problematic. So I, th I just thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I don't have any issue a bit in that. That was, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a spare of the moment and split second decision. Um, and I think anybody in their right mind that was sitting in a race car heading towards concrete at 200 miles an hour would have made the same decision. So yeah, no problem whatsoever. Yeah, understandable for sure.